Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Daryl Flack. I'm the Chief Information Officer and Co-Founder at Blockfish. We're a cybersecurity consultancy that specialises in the human aspects of uh, cybersecurity. Um, so I'll, I'm aware I'm the last thing that's leaving you from here to the uh, free drinks. So I'll rattle through at, uh, quite a fast pace. But if you have any questions, just feel free to shout out as we go. So most people's view of cybersecurity and hacking normally comes down to something like this. So has anyone seen Mr. Robot before? Yeah. So obviously this is a series on Netflix, and this is a stereotypical view that you normally see. Uh, Hollywood likes to uh, paint a picture that all the hackers are disaffected youth with a hoodie, sat behind a computer, doing lots of technical things. Um, the reality is that that probably has changed uh, over recent years. A lot of the tools that you need to do some of these hacks are freely available on dark web at a very cheap cost. And it's become ubiquitous in the fact that if you want to gain access to systems, in times gone by, you'd need people like this to do all of that work for you. Whereas now, actually, why go through all those technical controls when you can just phone somebody up, ask them their password, and potentially they'll give it to you and give access to all of their systems. So that's going to be the essence of what I talk about tonight. So 91% of attacks generally start with a phishing or spear phishing email. Um, that number's pretty staggering. Uh, Kira Martin, who's DG of National Cyber Security Centre, has said it's not a matter of if you're hacked, it's a matter of when. And there's no technical control in the world that can stop somebody at the end of a computer clicking on something they shouldn't. So that's quite a depressing view on the world. I tend to take some, some of that in a little bit more positive view. And what does that generally mean from our perspective and what is social engineering? So there's one, uh, God, that's not come out very well. Uh, there's one um, definition, which is the Wikipedia version. Obviously, I do lots of my research there. Uh, it says it's the ability to manip manipulate people into performing actions or divulging information. Um, but I think it's a bit stronger than that. Um, I think it's more around the exploitation of trust. And it's not just about manipulating people into performing, uh, into divulging information. It's about getting them to perform acts. It's about get, get, getting them to do something that you want them to do. And there's nothing new about this. This has been around in history for, uh, for millennia, ever since the um, beginning of man. There's always been people that try to trick other people into getting something that they wanted. And there's been uh, various examples of that throughout history. Um, and sometimes on my slides I have a timeline all the way through, but given the time pressures we're under tonight, I'll speed through. So why are those things possible? Why is it easy? Well, there's a, uh, there's a famous doctor, I wish I hadn't put the animations on now, uh, called Robert Cialdini, who has uh, six key factors that he talks about around influence, how every human being is vulnerable to certain influences. And I'll run through them very briefly. Uh, the first one, and the reason why it's first, is because it's the one that invariably when it comes to social engineering is um, the most effective. It's authority. If, somebody, if something is deemed to come from somebody in authority, then people are way more likely to act on it. So if people receive an email thinking it's from their boss or thinking it's from somebody um, senior, they're more liable to act on it. There's various uh, examples where people were stood there in lab coats overlooking somebody in an experiment, giving electric shocks. And it's amazing that people will go into the danger zone because somebody tells them to because they've got that look of authority to them. Consensus, that's very much where you're just following the trend. Um, all of these things, by the way, is exactly what we're all uh, focused on um, when we're buying stuff. Uh, it's what marketeers use all the time. Everyone else is buying it. It's the new big thing. Go and buy it. Equally, if you're trying to social engineer someone, make them feel like they're the ones not doing what everybody else is doing. Consistency. If you started something, you'll continue with it. And I'll come on to an example in a um, social engineering exercise that uh, I carried out a few weeks ago. Um, if you started down a path, then it's much more harder to break that path of action as you go along and you become more and more committed. Similarity, you're much more likely to do something uh, if you feel that the person is similar to you, if you feel like you have things in common with that person, if they're asking you uh, questions or requesting things of you that you would do for them, which leads on to uh, reciprocity. If somebody does something for you, you do something for them. Again, in a moment, I'll give you a quick example on a social engineering exercise where uh, we use that all of the time. Um, and again, if you're thinking about marketing, buy one, get one free. Oh look, they're giving me something. Loads of people outside a, a railway station giving you free stuff. They're not doing it because it's free, they're because they want something out of you. And scarcity, time limited. Do this now, it's going to run out in a, in a few minutes time or a few hours time. 
So these are the things that we're all susceptible to and we're all vulnerable to. But what does that mean in terms of organisations? Why would you be a target? Well, it's pretty simple, really. Do you have access to funds? Do you collect or process personal or sensitive information? Do you possess or have access to intellectual property? Uh, or do you have clients or suppliers or partners who do any of those things? And I'd be pretty impressed if there's any organisation out there that doesn't tick one or many of those boxes. The reason is we all have something of value, whether it's your personal lives, whether it's your personal bank accounts, whether it's the information that you hold, whether it's your address, whether it's your details, whether it's your corporate assets, your intellectual property, as it says up there, or your know-how or your knowledge. Somebody wants that because it's valuable, and why start from the beginning when you can get, have a head start and get it from somebody that's already there? So, I'll give you an example. This was an email that I sent to um, a financial services organisation in London. Very straightforward, looks like it's coming from HR, but you can see that the domain name isn't a real domain name, and it's very simple. Please find here, company announcement about the increase in your annual leave entitlement. Not too much on there, high importance. So at first glance, there's all these things in there. It's come from HR, it's quite authoritative. There's uh, something that's in there that's quite urgent, actually. There's an, a company announcement about an increase in my leave entitlement. I want to know about that. So you think that isn't, I, I would spot that. But of these 278 staff, uh, it was sent before 9am on a Wednesday morning. We generally find that if you send uh, phishing emails early in the morning, people are on mobile devices, they're uh, not likely to see the email address fully because it would just be a display name, uh, they're rushing and they're more likely to fall for them. Uh, of those, uh, 50 emails bounce back immediately. That's generally people out of the office, uh, people who are sick, um, or sometimes organisations don't always keep their distribution list up to date, so people have left the organisation but uh, have still got their emails out there. Of those 50, 57% open the email. In itself, that doesn't actually mean too much. All that does is confirm that it's a valid email address. Um, so not too much of a big risk about that. Equally, if you're opening your opening emails on a device, normally they download all of the images. So the way we know how people open images, we stick a one pixel in the middle of the email that as soon as you download the images, that pixel becomes active and we know. That's how marketeers use it on websites as well. So nothing too wrong with that, and most of those would have probably been mobile device users. 52% then clicked on the link. So if you think about the reason of having the link there, the purpose of that is that hidden within that link could be in all sorts of things like ransomware, key loggers, malware, all those sorts of things. That's how the um, payload of these attacks get distributed to machines. Of those 52%, 31% submitted data into a fake portal. So off the back of this, we created a portal, company logo, put your Windows password and username in here, and you'll see it. So 52% clicked into that and submitted their personal data. After that, we put a fake, uh, a dead page in there. So if they put their data in, it would just be a dead page. And the reason for that is that we wanted to see how many people, again, going on to commitment, they've got this far, how far will they go? is to see what they would do. And invariably, if you're told to do something and you click on a link and it doesn't work, something's not right, you report it. So of those, 2% then replied and started a dialogue with us because they weren't replying to HR, they were replying to us. Not just that, after the campaign had closed, we were the first name in their outlook when they started to tape HR. So as soon as they wanted to um, send something to HR, for weeks afterwards, we were getting requests to HR asking about leave entitlements, maternity leave, annual leave, all those sorts of things. So what you can see from that as an example is that even for something that's a very straightforward social engineering exercise, even if we just get one person, they reply to us. You can see how quickly and easy it is. So one of the big uh, uh, breaches that, or the attacks that we get at the moment is something called ATO, account takeover. And they start with something simple. In fact, that's how I got into um, my company. I was working for a large FTSE organization, um, and I found this out later on in the day, but the CEO, it wasn't actually the CEO, but sent an email, not too dissimilar to this, to the CFO, saying, are you in the office today? He was walking into the office, yes I am. Straight away, trust. You've got that view of trust, and then any emails that come through after that is the consistency again. We're buying a company, it's very top secret, I need you to be able to have some funds ready to transfer later, will you be available around midday? CFO replies, yes. And it's that sort of thing. The only reason why that funds transfer didn't go through was because actually they both came into the office at the same time, saw each other, and was a bit confused, and that's when they came to me. 
But those simple emails are where it all begins. And it's not just emails. Uh, so we do some social engineering exercises. So I'll take you through this example. This is Sarah. Um, she was asked to go into a law firm. They wanted to find out if she could A, get through security, B, go and uh, take pictures and C, uh, see what sort of documentation she can get access to. Um, as you can see, she, uh, she gained access. That's in the ladies' toilet in this law firm. Uh, I'm hoping it's the ladies' toilet anyway. Um, and the result was that she did it on three occasions. And there was no science behind it. We touched on the influencing factors earlier, reciprocity. She went to the smoking area. There was a group of guys stood there. She offered them a light. They accepted the light. They walked back in through the door. She followed them. You do something for me, I do something for you. It's also uh, very much a geographic thing as well. In the UK, we're all very polite. Often, we will do a reconnaissance on a building and we'll open up a door and we'll put a sign on the door and put a fire extinguisher in there saying, do not close the door. Who's going to close the door? There's a sign on it saying, don't close the door. We then come back when everyone's gone home, we gain access to the building. It's all these influencing factors that people rely on. It's what gives us our ability to have empathy and emotion, but it can also be the reason for some of our failings. So, what can you do to protect yourself? I don't know why all the fonts gone a bit bad, but um, awareness is one of the biggest things you can do. And that doesn't mean it's going to be three hours of e-learning on your last week before Christmas where you've got to do it or you're sort of uh, in HR's bad books. That never works for anyone. It's got to be fast. It's got to be one, two minutes at a time. It's got to be frequently. It's got to be digestible chunks. It's got to be interesting. It's no use giving really, really basic awareness learning to your IT team and your dev teams because they're too good for that. Find out where their weaknesses are and then give them stuff that is actually going to test them. A lot of the, a lot of the things that we try to do is bring gamification in. So put people in the hands of the attacker. They need to do the social engineering themselves. Craft a phishing email. How do you get more points from this game by targeting certain businesses with certain subject lines, with certain content? And once you get into that mindset of what people are trying to do to you, it makes you question those uh, emails and that social engineering techniques as they come in. Um, it's got to be measurable, it's got to be effective. And that's the big thing. Uh, people do it for compliance. Unfortunately, compliance doesn't equal security. Compliance is required in regulated environments, but just having a tick box doesn't mean you're secure. Every big breach that you'll see out there, were they all compliant? For the most part, yes, they were. They all had ISO 27001, but it didn't stop people not knowing what they should do at the right times. Um, and you've got to be able to test it as well. So you've got to make sure that you've got different complexities of how you're ensuring people know these things. You've got to carry these things out regularly, because how do you know if you're good at this unless you're being tested? And so what else can you do to protect yourself? There's the technical controls. You're always going to need those technical controls. You're going to need robust endpoint protection on your devices. You're going to need email gateways. You're going to need to put other um, aspects in, such as DMARC and uh, DKIM and SPF on your emails and things like that. But equally, you've got to reduce the information available. Now, that's very hard for some organisations. Um, we work a lot with law firms. And you go onto a, a law firm's page and you'll have every partner, all of their contact details, and sometimes their clients which for us is perfect. We just go on, we look at who their clients are, we send them an email pretending to be from one of their clients. Who's not going to respond to it if it's coming from their clients? But there's a balance there. You've got to assess the amount of information that you put publicly available online that people can use against you. But we're all in business, so there is that balance. And so finally there's a video, although I'm not sure it's going to actually work. So if it doesn't work, I'll actually just talk you through it. But the purpose of this really is that we're all susceptible, we're all vulnerable. And this is a clip of the Jimmy Kimmel show where he got some reporters to go out and ask people about password security. So if it works, I'll be amazed. One second. No. Okay, so it's not going to work, but effectively all that's about is this reporter going out and they're authoritative. They've got a mic, they've got a camera, and they'll ask people, uh, we're talking about password security, um, how do you go about your password security? And it'll be things like, oh, it's the year I graduated and my dog's name. And they'll be like, oh, so what college did you go to? What year did you graduate? Oh, do you like pets? Yeah, I like pets. Have you got a dog? Yes, what's your dog's name? And it's those sorts of things where even though it's all done within two or three seconds, 
people are looking at the camera, they are looking at the person of authority, and it makes them do things that their brain wouldn't otherwise tell them to do. So have a look, it's on YouTube anyway, um, and there's lots of examples of, of these types of social engineering. Just because you fall for it, doesn't make you stupid. It's, we're all susceptible. The trick is being able to understand at what point you realise something's wrong, and then report it as soon as you can. Happy to take any questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.